start whenever okay. you're ready. Thank you. I'll be wise verbally. Starting in three, two, one. In the status quo, entire lives are uprooted because people have to move countries due to climate change. Entire cities are soon to be submerged in water because sea levels are rising and yet carbon emissions are at their highest ever. Time and time again, this junk efforts to penalize the worst polluters have done nothing. A global problem requires a clear global solution proposed. Two constructive arguments in this speech. First, that global carbon markets most effectively reduce emissions that cause climate change. And secondly, that a global carbon market is the most economically feasible and optimal for the vast majority. But before that, a model. We would implement a global carbon market or a cap and trade system where a set amount of carbon permits are capped and are distributed to firms who either use their permits to emit or sell their permits to earn revenue. Four things to note. One, the cap will always be lower than the existing carbon emissions level, which is currently 40 billion tons of carbon. So each year, the cap will decrease based on carbon reduction goals, which are set at reducing emissions by 45% in 2030 and 0% in 2050. This means that there will be gradually less permits every year. But two, the permits will be distributed proportionate to the size of the company, its market share, and the average carbon emissions in that industry to account for the industries that have higher carbon reliance. So public auditing of the amounts of permits per firm will be done to prevent things like corruption. But three, companies are free to use or sell their permits to other firms that may need additional permits. So if ever any firm goes beyond the emissions that their permit allows, they will either have to buy permits or they will be fined per ton of carbon that exceeds the price of permits. But four, the UNEP will be the broker of this global market since they can establish global environmental standards. So to reliably discern what to base the permits on, they will collaborate with organizations that have decades worth of research, i.e. VERA and the gold standard, and there will be heavy fines in the instance that a company breaches their carbon limit. What are the alternatives then that opposition may support? We think one, governments imposing a fixed carbon tax, or two, the status quo where individual countries set up and regulate their own regional and national carbon markets, such as the EU, China, California market, they have to support one alternative because both of these are incompatible as prices are fixed by a tax or fluctuate depending on how many permits are traded. But before that, I'll take a POI. If the carbon credits that exist in the market are constantly going to be lowered, how exactly do companies actually profit from this model if they're not actually going to be able to sell the profits indefinitely? That brings me to my first argument, that global carbon markets most effectively reduce emissions that cause climate change. We are facing extreme droughts and floods that wreak havoc across the world, especially the global south. Climate change is an existential crisis that threatens billions, and the only way to save this is to ensure a predictable global reduction in carbon. Three reasons why this is true. Firstly, we guarantee reductions in emissions through efficient allocation of permits. So through permit trading, industries that can easily transition away from emissions are given the capital to do do so by selling their permits to other industries. This is additional revenue that can also be used to acquire greener technology. So for instance, coal-fired power plants, which generate 40% of the world's electricity, are able to cut down emissions by investing in cheap carbon dioxide scrubbers, which absorb emissions. In their world, carbon taxes and other similar programs reduce the capacity of industries to cut emissions because they cannot afford the technology. Plus, industries like power plants resort to decreasing output rather than reducing carbon significantly via via abatement technology. On either side, companies such as Chevron or BP will be able to pay for carbon pricing due to large profit margins and inflexible demand. On our side, we assure that thousands of other firms can sell their permits to afford green technology, maximally yeah. reduce emissions, all while making a profit. But secondly, we create better innovation in green technology. In our model, we incentivize firms to be less reliant on practices with higher carbon emissions because the cost of permits increase and our heavy monetary finance for breaching the carbon limit. So this creates an incentive to innovate new greener alternatives so firms don't pay exorbitant costs for permits and so they can earn from its sale. So firms now have more incentive to overhaul machinery or halt policies that are heavy in carbon. So we push companies like ExxonMobil to further invest in innovations such as renewable diesel. In their world, innovation is largely spurred by governments as revenue goes to states as opposed to firms. And this is less preferable for two reasons. One, governments are 
prone to corruption, especially if officials have interest in specific industries. In Malaysia, the government was accused of granting $200 million worth of hydropower contracts to companies linked to a minister. Oy. But two, even if corruption, I'll take you after this, doesn't occur, government subsidized individual firms for a greater return of investment. So these firms are shielded from competition and are more prone to mismanagement. So in 2009, Obama subsidized Solyndra, a solar panel company, only for it to file bankruptcy two years later due to gross mismanagement. In our world, mismanagement becomes a massive loss in revenue and competition forces firms to innovate better green tech. But thirdly, we prevent carbon leakage. In their world, national or regional programs incentivize companies to move manufacturing to areas with less regulation to save costs. So a firm in Germany can move production to North Africa to escape costs. Comparatively, a global carbon market ensures that firms cannot displace their emissions to other countries with weaker regulation. We protect developing countries from environmental destruction. On our side, we reduce emissions in a predictable and a collective manner, and we ensure greater forms of green innovation. I'll take your POI now. Why would technological companies share green technology and innovation with other states? That would mean that other states are less dependent on buying carbon credits because they transition to green energy. No, no, the argument here is that because they're selling it and they're able to earn profit and because they have incentives not to spend too much money in permits, they get extra revenue that they could probably use in things like green tech. But you have to be comparative and listen to our case on why places like governments are likely to be more susceptible to corruption and a lack of innovation. On our second argument, then, that a global carbon market is the most economically feasible and optimal for the vast majority. We want to frame this. In the status quo, the environment is important, but economic costs to people, i.e the loss of jobs or high prices are also important. So if we can prove that this policy best balances these interests, this mitigates a massive harm. And there are two reasons why we are able to do that. Firstly, we ensure flexibility during times of economic crisis. So during recessions, industrial outputs and emissions fall due to less purchasing power. This drives down the permits due to greater supply, ensuring that firms that need to emit can do so easily. After the 2008 financial crisis, the EU carbon market was able to ensure that firms can bounce back and revitalize the economy. In their world, carbon taxes are less adjustable since the price per carbon is fixed, is fixed, which means that when it is necessary to increase production to ensure that millions of people can be given jobs, can afford energy prices and afford gas, the fixed cost restrains them from doing so. But secondly, this market ensures that the optimal amount of carbon is being reduced. So the cap set are based on the necessary amount of emissions to be reduced based on scientific research, nothing more and nothing less. In their world, even in the best case, where you reach climate goals much faster by a tax, the cost is felt most by the people. This looks like forcing people to shoulder way more expensive. This looks like not just higher prices, prices of gas, but it's public transport and even basic goods getting higher because, the, because of transportation costs that are much higher. What is the way up of this? Solving climate change earlier has minimal benefit since research has already determined the most optimal reduction goals. However, the risk of causing massive economic harms would hurt the most vulnerable. On our side, we allow that flexibility that ensures that the most vulnerable don't get harmed. A global problem requires a global, a clear global solution. And I think that we sufficiently prove to you that global carbon markets are effective. We're very proud to propose. I thank the speaker for that fine speech and would now like to invite the honorable leader of opposition here, here. Hi, can I be heard? Yes. All right. Starting my speech in three, two, one. The climate crisis is none other than the product of capitalistic greed and short sighted pollution. This is the exact same mechanism proposition would use to solve a problem of their own creation. The stance from opposition is two things. One, this debate presumes there is already a strong demand to avert the climate crisis. So, absent of a global carbon market, we believe the following alternatives will rise to fill that gap. A, technology transfers between patent sharing for clean energy between nations in line with the pledges made during the Paris Climate Agreement and COP26. And B, development aid that enables developing nations to pursue sustainable development. For instance, the World Bank has granted $20 billion in aid to aid the transition to renewable energy sources. To be clear, opposition's burden today is not as Prime Minister asserts that we don't have to prove a successful counter policy, but instead we will prove why the global carbon market is destined for failure 
And in that process, they destroy all viable alternatives. Crucially, we have limited political and economic capital as well as a looming climate deadline, and we cannot change our limited resources on a failing solution. Before I talk about two arguments from the side of opposition, three key responses to the speaker before me. Firstly, on their mechanism of what their climate, their carbon market is going to entail. Two things. Number one, they say they're going to create a capped market based on the size of the company and the size of the industry. I think firstly that this is critically naive because the largest global companies are the largest polluters, are the wealthiest, are the ones with the largest capacity to transition into green technology. They should not be allowing these people to continuing to emit. But we think it's the smallest nation companies in the smallest nations of developing nations who need the allocations the most because they cannot transition as wealthy. They don't have the existing capital to invest into green technology and begin the transition. They cannot be as charitable as they assert that the UN or their climate body will not be able to allocate as charitably as they assert, given that for the for emissions to truly be fixed in the like near future, the entire world has to transition into a net zero globally green economy but within the next year, which we think is impossible for these developing nations and smaller companies to adapt to, especially given since proposition wants to favor larger nations and larger companies. But secondly, when they tell you that the cap is going to be continuously lower, that already dashes the profit sharing incentives to truly invest and meaningfully partake and enter the market. Why? Because we think when you invest into the carbon market, what you really want to do is have a guaranteed and return on investment, you need to make sure that the carbon credits that are here today will be here next year and will be here in five years so that the value doesn't go down. On proposition, insofar as you are constantly slashing the size of the carbon market yearly, what was valuable last year is no longer as valuable this year. Proposition cannot claim that these companies still have the incentive, given that it's so unreliable and it's such a non-profitable like, market to invest to, given that there are still many others and it's so far cheaper to go into green technology. But on their arguments, number one, they see this is effective in reducing emissions. I think we'll like to note up top that proposition sets out their own burden as sinking islands, as natural disasters. Then their best case is that they reduce emissions in the environment. It's unclear as to how these two are empirically linked. But on that rebuttal specifically, I think when they tell you about the impact of climate change, it's uncontentious. We think it's a problem on both sides. Only proposition tries to solve it through emissions. We don't. But secondly, we think that they cannot guarantee the emissions reductions in existence because we think that like a carbon market inherent, inherently means that you have to pollute. You have to emit in order for carbon permits to be given out, meaning that proposition cannot guarantee the reduction in emissions given that they're inherently permitting it. But thirdly, we think carbon leakages are contingent on opt-in in and of itself. Given that we told you it's too strict for many developing nations to economically opt-in, we think they're likely to opt out of the system altogether. Even if you sanction them, we think they're likely to form their own economic trade blocks to exist outside of a carbon market, and they can continue polluting and still have carbon leakages as they claim. But the second argument on whether or not this is economically feasible, I think this already deals with their own case. This is a contradiction insofar as they say there's like the wealth, the financial incentives for companies to invest and then say that there will be no incentive for companies to malevolently invest so that developing nations will end up well. They have to pick one. Somebody has to lose out in this debate. Flexibility only exists insofar as there is no rigid cap and trade system. Propositions comparative of a carbon tax is disingenuous because it is not what we are defending. Two arguments then. Firstly, on why a global carbon market will pretty fail to solve the climate crisis. Three things. One, a current market innately permits carbon emissions. There are two mechanisms inherent to it. The first is tradable carbon permits, which allows countries to pay their way out of pollution. And the second is carbon credits, or by creating carbon offsets projects, which means that a factory in Denmark can still emit 100 tons of CO2, as long as it offsets it by planting trees in Africa to absorb 100 tons. But this is problematic because of resounding scientific evidence that once emitted, the average ton of CO2 remains in the atmosphere for a thousand years before it is fully reabsorbed. While carbon sinks still hold some value, the process of carbon reabsorption does not outpace rapidly how rapidly we are approaching climate apocalypse. At best, offsetting carbon emissions is a mitigatory solution when the priority should be to emit as little as possible to a transition to green energy. But secondly, the carbon market policy is hinged on a false presumption that there is a one-to-one -one ratio between carbon emission and carbon absorption. However, the amount of carbon that is released and reabsorbed via the same actions is entirely different across ecosystems, i.e. a slight change in temperature could massively degrade the ability of a carbon sink to absorb carbon. While PROP may be able to measure the carbon emissions from clearing an acre of forest, if that ecosystem has an unexpected underground wetland, it could unpredictably emit methane after deforestation. It no, could I very well be true that one ton of CO2 emitted required an offset of 10 tons of CO2 over time. As ecosystems are unique, no scientific instrument can 
accurately measure and inform the carbon offset system. Prop hinges the fate of humanity on unreliable calculations. But lastly, companies and countries will prioritize tokenistic and damaging carbon offset projects. Sustainable offset projects like wind and solar energy are costly. So to maximize the profit of carbon credits, low cost projects are undertaken, like Chile's mass planting of eucalyptus forests. Carbon, a cheap, fast growing tree that absorbs tons of carbons but decimates biodiversity and ecosystems, further harming the environment. Science shows that these forests can also store carbon for only about 100 years before degrading and then run the risk of contributing toward climate change when impacted by floods, severe weather, disease, and altered land practices. Forests go from carbon sinks to carbon sources because the vegetation adapts to release CO2 instead. Therefore, prop strategy is a short-term mitigation that is unsustainable, unreliable, and wastes resources on harmful projects. Before I go on to my second argument, I'll take a point. So how will the model and opposition work, presuming all these harms do exist? We already told you that our burden is not to solve climate change, but rather that you destroy all of the incentives for them to solve like through other methods. But also noting, we don't define a carbon market, right? All of these harms are unique to a carbon market. The failure of emissions is unique to a carbon market. We can do other things like other kinds of conservation that you destroy uniquely on your side of the house. But the second argument about how introducing profit into the climate solution creates perverse incentives for three ways. One, participants enter the carbon market for one reason only, to profit from obtaining carbon credit and permits. This incentive incentivizes them to ensure that the carbon market exists in perpetuity, so they resist the full transition to clean energy. If nations are reducing their reliance on carbon, no one will purchase their carbon credits, killing off their business models and selling credits. But secondly, we think a global carbon market will require you to measure the carbon footprint of every company on the planet. Given that universal jurisdiction to that degree is impossible, the market will have to rely on decentralized local institutions for oversight, like how the WHO's influence is enforced via local authorities. Therefore, and this engages with propositions second argument, countries with weak regulatory bodies will be weaponized by companies exploiting the blind spots in the system of enforcement in order to profit, i.e. Mumbai's GFL gas project earns credit through forged paperwork, enabling it to continue polluting, but it's still the largest supplier of carbon credits for European firms. The commodification of carbon corrupts the fight against climate change, entrenching the very system that engineered the disaster. We cannot allow it to exist. I thank the speaker for that fine speech and then I'd like to invite the Honorable Deputy Prime Minister here. here. Hello, am I visible and audible? Yeah, you're both. Okay. Uh, <coughs> <coughs> uh, POIs through voice, please. Starting my speech in three, two, one. A global problem requires a global solution, one that recognizes the existential threat of climate catastrophe, while also ensuring that it is not the most vulnerable that bear the brunt of the transition. And that is what a global carbon market provides, an opposition's attack is only to straw man our model and attack a wholly different model altogether. I'll talk about two things in response. Firstly, in the environment, secondly, in the economy. But before that, there's a lot of clarifications I want to make and a clarification as to what the opposition burden is. I first want to clarify what their counter model is. And they give you a vague counter model that at no point do they actually defend. They don't explain why tech transfers and development aid are sufficient or exclusive in this debate to be able to ensure that you're able to reduce the number of carbon emissions, which directly ensures that a lot of people, millions of people in the global south are protected. The first thing I'd point out, this is largely contingent on ensuring that there is innovation. We explain to our argument, which is no response that we're actually able to spur better forms of innovation through private companies having the capital to be able to invest in their own forms of green tech, especially when there's incentive to transition now, given that permits will likely decrease the number of emissions you're able to have. So insofar as they want to stand by tech transfers, we're better able to have tech that is distributed among many different firms insofar as there's a profit incentive to want to, to profit from these kinds of innovations that you make. But secondly, this for, these forms of develop, development aid is unclear as to why this is largely inexclusive insofar as there are different actors that are engaging in things like giving out development aid as opposed to setting up a global carbon market. And therefore, they don't explain as to why us being able to directly transfer aid is better than us being able to ensure small companies can sell off permits to ensure that they themselves have that capital, which is our way of achieving ensuring that smaller companies don't die. But the last thing to point out is 
no analysis as to why any of this is effective, no analysis to explain why you reduce emissions in the long term, which is the most important goal to be able to avert climate catastrophe, and therefore they have to automatically lose this debate. Secondly, on our model, the first thing I want to clarify is they attempt to like attack our fiat by saying we don't have the fiat to ascertain that this model acts in a certain way. Firstly, we do. This is a policy debate, and therefore we're able to ensure that allocations are done on the basis of your historical emissions to ensure that we're able to take into account how much you've emitted, but also the fact that decreased caps will still likely exist. Their response is to say the decreased caps won't be profitable, and therefore companies won't opt in. It is the fact that it is profitable because over time, if you decrease the supply of permits, the amount, the price per permit is incredibly large at that point, and therefore it's lucrative to sell it, and therefore companies are not likely to be as averse as they want to talk about. So our model stands, but also we give you structural reasons as to why it is likely to stand. Firstly, on the environment, and I want to frame this as the most important issue. Currently, thousands of people are being displaced, sea levels are rising, and we need to ensure we have a solution to be able to reduce carbon emissions. Their first attack was to say, how do they sell it if it decreases over time? Obviously, firms that require more than what was given initially will have to buy permits, especially as we explained, the cap that we set is less when they are currently being emitted. But the second thing to point out, as we explained, the amount of revenue is larger over time, especially as we decrease the supply of permits that increases the price of permits and therefore... And what that means is more people are more firms are likely to want to sell it to be able to ensure they get some revenue. The second thing that they say is that these firms will opt out of this system altogether. Firstly, it is unclear how they will opt out, given that they will, when they will be sanctioned, it will be massively economically harmful. Their attempt to say that there's an economic block to prevent the harm is unclear, especially when you are directly being fined. It's unclear how an economic block can protect you from that. But the second thing to point out, it is just untrue that they will opt out because for the reason that small companies are able to sell the permits over time. If insofar as larger businesses will want to get permits from you, you have the ability to get revenue as a consequence of selling that permit. And therefore the transition is much easier since you have the money to afford things like carbon offs like carbon abatement technology, things like CO2 scrubbers to ensure that you can afford the transition in the first place. They don't for large companies and large countries don't forcibly take those permits from you. They have to sell it to them to begin with. And therefore the transition is likely to be smoother. And therefore you're not likely to have that loss of buy-in. The first argument is to say it will fail. And I want you to note, all of their argumentation is hinged on a caricature of the model, which we did not set in to begin with. The first thing we pointed out was the cap will be lessened over time. And therefore, even if they will, perm they will emit the maximum amount, that is much better than the alternative where they will still emit 40 billion tons, where on our side, we can set the cap lower or lower to be able to ensure that we reduce emissions over time. The second thing to point out is offsets are not in our model. We explained it's just about permits themselves and the ability to emit carbon in the first place. And therefore, it's unclear what model they were rebutting in the first place. But the third thing to point out is Offsets are better than the comparative because on the comparative, none of these firms have the incentive to plant trees. None of these firms have the incentive to reduce their carbon emissions in the first place. And therefore, on weighing, if a firm is more willing to do things like create, like plant more trees to absorb carbon rather than in their side where there's no incentive at all, that is comparatively more preferable. The second thing that they say is that emissions is not, is not correlated to things like the, the ability to absorb this carbon. The first thing to point out is this might be true, but if we ensure that we reduce emissions over time, which they do not properly contest, we're able to reduce the, amu the amount of the harm of carbon, but just by having less carbon on net, and therefore we still win this clash, even if that might be true, it's unclear as to why that mitigates, our, that all that does is mitigate our claim to begin with. The last thing that they say is it's profit-oriented, and I don't know why this is bad. We explain that we maximize profit and we align the incentive of profit to be able to transition to a greener, more re renewable form of society. So it's unclear as to why you, ma like you maximally emitting is much better because on the comparative, you still emit 40 billion. On our side, you have the cap to ensure that it's limited Point. to 38 billion. But the second thing to point out is on this notion of corruption, the first thing I'd like to note is this is unlikely to begin with, given there will be global oversight. If firms in smaller developing nations will be able to like skirt regulation, that is going to receive massive backlash and therefore larger firms are likely to want to ensure that that regulation is stringent and therefore they'll likely want to fund things like ensuring proper scrutiny from these as well because it harms them if smaller firms are able to amass more permits in the first place. But lastly, this is all just wholly uncomparative. They never explain well Wait. their alternative of being able to have tech transfers actually ensures you reduce carbon. We explained one, you reduce emissions by giving them pro the profit incentive to afford it and the incentive to want to be able to sell permits because it increases over time. Two, that you get better forms of innovation insofar as now firms are now more likely to want to sell their permits because they're not reliant on them because it becomes more expensive to buy them. But three, you reduce global carbon leakage that a firm in Germany is now able to transfer to North Africa because there's no regulation there, which destroys local economy. No response to any of that. Before I move on, go.
offsets take a thousand years and you're investing everything and every other present climate alternative into that into something that at its best case will only exist in a millennia. So how are you going to solve climate change? Firstly, offsets are not in the model. Secondly, even if it were, it's comparatively better that our sites plant some trees and your site plants no trees. Third, you have no solution to be able to reduce carbon emissions. It's unclear as to why you have a comparative. Secondly, in economic impacts. This is not a tension. We explained that you needed to cross the line and you needed to like walk the line of being able to ensure we reduced carbon emissions while not placing the harm directly towards the people who are most vulnerable. And we were able to do that because we had a greater degree of flexibility that in times of crisis where carbon it was less emitted, that increased the supply of permits, which decreased the price, which means that when you needed to restart the economy, as we saw in 2008 in the EU, you're better able to do so. No response at all from that. And therefore, we're able to ensure that you're, that you're able to, like, to mitigate the extent of that economic harm in the first place. We win on the environment and we mitigate the economic harms clearly winning this debate. Lastly, on our extension, I think we prevent developing economies and firms from being, from being crushed by foreign competition. Because under their side, global carbon leakage still happens. The EU market still exists under their side. And therefore, a lot of EU, EU firms still go to places like Africa, still go to other places not, not in that carbon market, which destroys these countries not only environmentally, but also economically as well. When you are crowded and smaller and local firms within those regions are destroyed because they cannot compete against European firms. When China goes to other regions to escape the Chinese market, those Chinese businesses are able to destroy local, re local businesses within those regions. And therefore, it destroys local livelihood. It raises prices because they destroy other competition. And our side, a global carbon market prevents carbon leakage, which they have no response to, which is beneficial environmentally, but also ensures economically that they don't harm small businesses, which ensure we get greater forms of employment under our side. For all of these reasons, we win on the environment. They have no comparative. We win on the economy. They don't explain why that's better on their side as well. I'm very proud to propose. I thank the speaker for the final speech and would now like to call upon the honorable deputy leader of opposition here, here. Great, yeah, can I check that I'm audible? Yes, yes you are. Okay, great. Um, I'll take my POIs verbally, so just unmute yourself. Starting in three, two, one, a global carbon market. Let's call it for what it really is, a global subsidy for carbon emissions. When the potential harm is human extinction, the solution can't merely be marginally reducing carbon emissions and trading away permits to permit other individuals to do the same. Because a world of clean and renewable energy was the only way in order to solve it, but proposition shot all of those possibilities down. Your survival panel hangs in the balance. If you value life, you have to side with opposition. Before I move on to additional rebuttal and material, a quick clarification as to what the burden is. Because I think Second Prop likes to assert that our burden has to be defending an effective alternative when it truly is not, given the burden clarification even came out in first opposition. Our burden is simple. We had to prove that the global carbon market was a useless strategy and it meant three things. That A, time and resources on an issue where neither could be afforded were wasted and should have gone to other viable alternatives. Secondly, that succumbing to profit incentives meant that competition and money were prioritized and effectively called SID alternatives. And that lastly, opposition's case relied on them heavily proving the success of the global carbon market, which means that if we prove why it was to fail, we showed why they failed to meet their own burden that they set out for them. We did not, however, have to prove why our preferred alternatives were better, merely that proposition closed all doors for climate solutions, trapping us into an all-for-one strategy, which meant that all of the political allocation and resources that goes to the carbon market necessitates a trade-off from all other alternatives that would have naturally existed absent of this creation and absent of that policy. So yes, we don't have to prove that we solve the climate crisis because that was never our burden. That was your burden that you imposed onto yourself. But if we explain to you why there was more harm in the creation of the global carbon market that was sufficient to absolve ourselves of that burden. But before, but additionally, on to responses and clarifications. Firstly, note that the reason why our alternatives are mutually exclusive are for a number of reasons. I did not think I would have to clarify this in a policy debate that they themselves outlined. There is clearly opposition fiat. So first, Prop exhausts all of their existing political capital to create and to create and facilitate the carbon market as the foremost global climate strategy. That is massive amounts of capital taken away from the other alternatives that also require global buy-in in order to succeed. 
Second, PROP is creating competing market incentives towards solving the climate crisis, allowing stakeholders to profit from the carbon off, um, carbon trading from the carbon permits that they are going to trade will make it less likely that they will share green energy patents and make it accessible to market competitors. We explained this in a POI. They never actually wanted to engage and just called it assertive and that there was no response. The response from first opposition was extremely clear that yes, you, the reason why companies and firms won't invest in innovation is because it creates an, it, it creates an environment where other nations are able to transition and become green, which means that it does not matter in second proposition's clarification that the price of carbon permits becomes more expensive as the carbon market shrinks because less countries require the purchasing of said carbon permits, which means they are null and void, which is why innovation is not a point that proposition wins, but it's rather on art because capitalism does not intervene. But lastly, every dollar invested in the carbon point. market is a dollar invested into a policy that will fail. So the opportunity cost is very clear and we would only provide it in our alternatives that were not even vague. We outlined two things, the development of clean energy and the development aid for countries who need to transition to sustainable development. Them saying that the alternatives were vague and wanting, wanting to only engage in the two mechanisms that they tried to assert from first proposition is not the fault of opposition, but the fault of Team Philippines for not actually preparing. Moving on to additional um, real rebuttal. Note that we talked to you about why the enforcement mechanism was necessarily important, and they never wanted to concede this. They just assert that they have fiat and therefore they can create the carbon market. That was not the response we gave to you on first opposition. We told you, you have fiat to implement and the fiat to create the global carbon market, but you need to explain to us the process as to how it is likely to manifest. We said that for every single global institution, there is no such thing as universal jurisdiction and universal oversight. The WHO is not able to enforce policies. The ICC Point. is unable to enforce policies onto nations, even when they ratify it, which is why you require a default model of a decentralized system, which meant that capitalism and the corporations that they wanted to characterize are now introduced with incentives where in the chain of command, where there are multiple individuals, the local governors that approve the projects, the individuals that are supervising said projects, all in that chain are prone to being able to be bought over and bribed, which is why 71% of carbon projects and carbon permits that were given to China in their own regional block were under review and later on review to be invalid because of perverse incentives that you introduce into said market. So insofar as their mechanism doesn't actually work, they have to defend the likely failures of that alternative rather than relying on fiat. Second, we argue to you why global op a lack of global opt-in was the reason why carbon leakages was responded to. They wanted a heavily punitive mechanism. Not on their side, they wanted to argue carbon reduction for the smallest, poorest firms, that their first argument was hinged on the idea that the poorest corporations will transition because they're able to make money off tradable carbon permits. Panel. The individuals and the stakeholders in this debate that are going to be giving off and selling off their permits are not small corporations. These are the industries with the least capacity to transition to be green, the least capacity to innovate and change their current practices. So those are the individuals Point. in proposition wanted to defend. They also gave them the least amount of carbon credits because these small industries were not the largest historical polluters in the status Quo, which means that these nations are going to be heavily mechanized and punitive um, and heavily sanctioned on their side by their own mechanism are likely going to opt out, which is why first opposition response was highly crucial in terms of if they were to opt out of this global system, carbon leakages would still exist and it's a harm that you manifest because they would create rogue decentralized systems where they all collectively opt out and collude. That was the response to first and second opposition, first and second proposition that they never wanted to take. The form one strategy point. So why would a firm that has little capacity to transition sell the remaining permits that they have that allow them to emit in the first place rather than them only selling it when they realize they could use the revenue to be able to transition, which is the more likely incentive that they have? No, because when you create the carbon cap, you're actively losing money. The money that you get from selling the permit is literally to offset the policy that you implemented and forced onto them. Moving on to a third substantive, but note that the first argumentation from first opposition was literally completely ignored and not engaged with, 
We told you why even in its perfect state, the carbon market is going to fail because carbon emissions and carbon reductions can't be the way to go. We told you why even in their best case when they offset or they're able to trade the permits to other individual nations and other individual corporations for other incentives, that it does not matter because you inherently allow carbon emissions to exist in the ecosystem. So even if you offset it, the offset only happens in a thousand years because the absorption from the green projects that you created are not going to immediately take away the carbon dioxide in the air and the atmosphere, which means that the climate degradation is your harm to bear. But on to the last um, substantive material then, as to why the, it is imperative that proposition not spend any of our finite resources on the carbon market over more viable alternatives. While the up burden is to prove more harm than good, rather than a counter proposal, we will prove that as long as there are alternatives that are far more viable, it is perhaps imperative to prioritize these above those things. They said we never proved effectiveness. We said very clearly in first opposition and in this argumentation that development aid meant that we enabled smaller transitions for the kinds of individuals that they said are too poor to transition in developing nations. We talked about green technology transfers, which are only unique to our side because capitalism would dictate that you don't share technology because that would mean the carbon trading is going to be killed off and called on their side. The world will burn on proposition. It will be team proposition who joins them in the fire they ignite it. I thank the speaker for that fine speech. Now to wrap up the substantive speeches for the government side, I invite the honorable government to appear here. Hi, um, am I audible and visible? Yeah, you're both. All right. Um, just to what they call this, um, just to reiterate, uh, yeah, like just to reiterate, I prefer my POIs through chat, please. Speech start in three, two, one. We need to reach net zero, but we also need to recognize that our world is interlinked with carbon activity. Team Philippines then justly believes that a global problem requires a clear global solution. A few things on housekeeping before I proceed to my clashes. Firstly, they have to prove the counterfactual is better because the only importance of resources that could go to other alternatives point coming from O2 is under the premise or relied on the premise on proving that the alternative is better. And that's why it is bad when you divert said resources from that alternative. The second thing is they said that second thing I want to point out is that if there are existing organizations that give developmental aid and give altruistic donations for green technology and the shifting of, the te of technology in developing nations, these are symmetric. We are talking about the free market. We are talking about the private enterprises that aren't altruistic, that aren't the ones that giving developmental aid because there's no profit with giving developmental aid to poor countries. The last thing is, this is covered by fiat. It is implicit to the policy that we need a global body. But also corollary to this, if they push on corruption, their alternative of distributing developmental aid and investing in green technology presumably also becomes vulnerable to corruption. So this is a wash. Additionally, they also need a body to facilitate the said distribution of developmental aid, the investing of green technology, and like monitoring and making sure that all of these resources actually go to whatever policy they want to be implement. So it is false to assume that it is only on our side that in the global body and there's a don't. You have to assume that it's true. Two clashes then. Firstly, are we able to effectively reduce carbon emissions? And secondly, where do you best balance economic interests with environmental goals? Firstly, are we able to reduce carbon emissions? And I just want to flag early, like before I proceed to the content that if their problem is to say that it takes 1,000 years before carbon emissions leave the planet, the first thing I want to point out is, obviously we're talking about the carbon emissions that have yet to be made, but secondly, is that if they don't, if they do take 1,000 years, it's also unclear how an opposition, they also tend to just leave faster. So that's a wash. We make a few simple claims. Firstly, that we have an efficient allocation of permits that lower emissions and aid in the transition of going green. Secondly, we get better innovation by creating incentives for firms to do so. But lastly, is that we prevent carbon leakage, which undercuts a lot of environmental policies because the status quo is firms could leave and go to countries with less stringent policies if ever that there are good policies in some areas. They make a few claims. First is that we can have technological sharing. First, 
the guards that would want to freely share will do so anyway. But two, for the organizations that don't give tech for free and actually want a cost, the cap and trade provides the capacity since you can sell permits and use it to afford green technology. If they say that there are certain firms that are smaller that would not be able to sell as much permits, the first thing I want to point out is that is all right because these are probably the firms that can easily transition to being green exactly because they are less in volume. They require less facilities to overturn and overhaul to greener technology. But second is that because they are smaller, presumably that also means that there is not much technology that they need to purchase to be environmentally friendly because they don't even wreck as much emissions to begin with. The second thing they try to say is that there's less innovation because we are unsure. Firstly, there will be less permits in supply, which means they're more valuable. But secondly, if it won't, because they assume that companies are also becoming less reliant on carbon, which is fair to which is fair, one, not all companies transition at the same pace. Some need more permits than others. So you will still be able to make money. The incentive still stands. But secondly, even if you can't sell anymore, it's the fact that you don't want to be fine. And take note, we explain that the fines are going to be far expensive than purchasing a permit. So that's an active incentive for firms to innovate. The last thing they try to say is that companies will go to low-cost projects. One, if they last for 100 years before degradation, that's 100 years of additional time to come up with a better solution that is more long-term. Because the problem, and they consider this, that a lot of long-term solutions are vastly and immensely expensive. So if anything, this buys time for companies to, de to, uh, like de to, to develop that. But secondly, they don't prove on their side why companies will want to invest on the high-cost projects to begin with. I will flip this because and say that this is actually something that happens on our side. If it's true that low-cost projects don't get rid of much carbon, it will garner less permits. So it's on our side that companies are more likely to invest on costlier projects exactly because they reduce the most carbons. And therefore, if they don't give them the additional permits, at least they prevent them from getting heavily fined then. How do you weigh this? One, if the transition to being green is what will spell climate catastrophe to individuals, whether we like it or not, then it's a carp and tree that is best able to do this. They say we get things like, uh, like green technology or giving developmental aid for nations, but they don't explain where is the teeth on that because you could give the resources, but if you don't give the incentives to do so, then surely they will not and they, they, wouldn't, uh, like they, they wouldn't transition. Before I proceed, point of information. Yeah, it is not symmetric. We made pledges to share and provide tech and aid in status quo. We told you that in your world, you contravened all those existing incentives because you introduced a new one, which is profit in game. Yeah. yeah, so this is an a zero sum. Exactly what you said. These are already deals that were made before the policy was made. In the same way as how, doesn't mean that a government passes a new policy. It means that you have to revoke all the other past policies that they made because those have different budgets and different allocations of resources. You have uh, this is not reasonable for us to defend. The second issue then is where do we best balance economic interests with environmental goals? In a few meta debating before I proceed, they don't actually try to make any compelling reason as to how we're able to balance these things. And this is and this is just sad because we acknowledge that. In any environmental project, there has to be economic risks. So in which system are we able to reduce that? What do we prove coming from proposition? Firstly, that we ensure flexibility during times of crises. Taxes are fixed, but the market is flexible such that when prices fall, presumably also the permits as well. So we're still having the incentive fit ends up to going green without exactly bankrolling entire firms in doing this. But secondly, that we ensure the optimal amount of carbon is being reduced because we don't exactly reduce too much, but we also don't exactly reduce too little. The last is on extension, and this was important, that we prevent the degradation of developing economies from being crushed by foreign, co for foreign competition. Exactly because on their side of the house, assuming the best case that you put money into green technology and help firms in developing countries transition to being green, what will you do with all of the polluters that come from developed nations that exactly go to developing nations exactly because there are less, uh, like there are less regulations or there are like not much penalties in, in to going there and polluting? None of their policy actually addresses the problem the, that we propose coming from proposition side. The fact that if there are good environmental policies, companies will shift to countries that have less, less, less so. And this is something that we uniquely solve on our side of the house. The remaining claim, like the remaining claim that we do have is that we are likely to 
penalize smaller countries since they don't have the capacity to transition. First, least that their that their own model solves this, especially since we've proven it's not exclusive. But secondly, we don't exactly because smaller countries usually uh, produce the least amount of emissions and therefore are probably least likely to be fined with the policy. But also those are least likely to get to need the permits and are ones that are likely to sell the permits exactly because the largest polluters usually come on hyper-capitalistic nations as they've pointed out themselves. For all those reasons and more, we get a global solution that will solve a catastrophic problem. Opposition leaves us to the fire of propose. I thank the speaker for that fine speech and now to wrap up the substantive speeches as a whole, I invite the Honorable Opposition Whip. They're here. Hi, am I visible and audible? Yes, yes you are. Right. I'll take POIs in the chat. I'll start in three, two, one, capitalism created the climate crisis and for prop to encourage the profit incentive to once again hijack our climate transition was suicide for their case. The downfall of this proposition team so far was their misunderstanding of the round. All of first and second props rhetoric on sinking islands is non-contentious because there are incentives to go green regardless per their own analysis. If there was no initial capital to want to enter green transitions, then the debate couldn't take place because you can't form a global market. Per their own fiat response, we would be able to use this under our model as well. Second, I want you to know that all of their responses were just saying, you don't have a solution. We at least got something. Clearly, they were not listening. Let's clarify the burden in the round. First, this prop team took on the burden for themselves because they were the ones that explicitly wanted to revert the crisis entirely. The opposition stance was not to propose a successful counter policy, but they were pre-existing solutions for the crisis. However, the solutions would go extinct under their side because they introduced the market incentives that will redirect away political capital from these same solutions. But then what are these alternatives and why will they be successful? We explained from first and second, there will be things like green tech and patent sharing, development aid to build green infrastructure, etc. Don't be fooled by the third prop though, because it's not mutually it is mutually exclusive and it's not symmetric. The reason for this was is that most of these things were giving things towards developing countries from the developed world. And the structural reason for why you aren't able to do that on the DR side is because you want them to now buy your credits. At the point where they had access to the same green energy as you, there's no reason why they would want to buy your credits to pollute because they don't have to pollute anymore, which means you can't kill away all benevolent incentives to make other countries go green in favor of your own profit incentive to upkeep the carbon market. So therefore, they undermine your entire model. That was a fatal concession from third prop. To be clear, how do we attain the political and economic capital to go green? First, there are pre-existing business and political incentives to go green, to avoid experiencing environmental damage, to avoid reliance on fossil fuel. So second prop is it's incorrect. There's no reason why they would want to do this under their side. There's lots of reasons why. However, PROP introduces a competing incentive, which is the economic incentive given they wanted to force countries to spend the money to buy the credits or even sanction them. Therefore, economic survival contradicts the initial incentive to go green and opposition reverses all existing political capital. In comparison, tax sharing was based on positive reinforcement instead of negative one, which means that countries were likely to opt in. The second was on contextual realism. So we've seen developing countries and developed countries as well, both opt into things like the Paris Climate Agreement, which is one of the largest global agreements of all time. So once again, opt into uses a competing incentive by saying if you give the developing world clean energy, they will no longer buy your carbon credit. So this means that you make all other alternatives unfeasible. Their only response was second prop's assertion that you don't get innovation. First, if these are developing countries and they probably can't independently develop to the same extent anyways. But second, I don't care if they got innovation under their side, but zero access. From all three speakers to no response, we told you that the biggest barrier behind clean energy was not only the cost, but the patterns behind them, which our solution dealt with. So even if you believe they got innovation, the innovation never mattered because its value was in the access towards people and they never got that. It's far too late to clarify this in reply. So it doesn't matter if they got some solution. We told you that solution was damaging and condemned global climate action for good. If the market is destined for failure, we must oppose it because we're expending resources on something that will ultimately be lost. There are three issues then in this speech. First, on the 
inherent failures of the carbon market. This is by nature a very scientific realm, but prop ignores all these nuances. Three categorical harms that they never contended with. First, Offsets still enable emissions. You can build a factory and later offset the carbon from that factory by planting a forest. The problem was that it takes years for all that carbon to successfully be reabsorbed by the forest. So in the meantime, that carbon still exists in the atmosphere, creates the greenhouse effect and kills all of the same harms that they wanted to talk about. And the second part, we told you this, the state subsidizes this process. Their response in third prop was this was for future carbon, but this means that they're never able to do it in time for all their benefits to accrue because the carbon was already still there. But second, carbon cycles are different from ecosystem to ecosystem, which means they are unable to gauge this accurately. These two flaws are unavoidable. It's not about government incentives, it's scientifically proven. So even if you can get better scientific estimations, it was impossible to do this reliably. This uncertainty means their benefits are volatile, but also decreases op decreases confidence and opt into this policy. But third, there was a tendency to opt into low cost projects. See the eucalyptus farms we explained from first op are a good and fast way to get carbon out of the atmosphere but unquantifiable harms in damaging the ecosystems and the biodiversity in the environment because you created these monocultures. Why is this true? It's because of second prop's own words. It's a massive amount of money they can earn so they create a race to the bottom to who can nab carbon credits in time by creating low cost projects which ultimately harm the environment even more so they fail on their own metric. They can't say we'll send scientists to advise what are good projects because it reduces autonomy and increases opt-out. Why is this important? First, it engages them on their best possible grounds. Even if you believe all their arguments, this was showing that the nature of the carbon projects destroys the environment. Their only response was from, sec from third prop was that it buys time, but this kills their case because they wanted absolute speed. For that, I'll take a point from, yeah, I'll take a point. This is all contingent on innovation. If we incentivize private actors to innovate more, they can profit from selling green tech. On either side, profit incentives exist. No. Why would they invest in green tech if it doesn't so align with the profit incentive? The difference here is that there are, in, there are already initial incentives to go green for the motion to work and also to prevent the harms of climate change. But now it's harder for you to focus on going green because you introduce a competing incentive to have low cost projects to get the carbon credits in time. So your competitors don't get it, but also because there are also the economic sanctions, which means your price priorities shift from this to other incentives. So you kill off the current trend of going green. First, what do we hear from them? Two things. First, they claim governments are corrupt, which is why we need to let it do this to companies. Number one, this is damaging for their case because this means the carbon systems reporting is also corrupted. Note that we told you from second opposition about how you need to decentralize this to local governments to report it. And that's how you're able to get the carbon credits. This means that under their side, they were also susceptible to corruption. They never mechanize this, which is why our setup still takes precedence here. What was the comparative? You cannot be corrupt when it comes to things like developmental aid because they are conditional loans from other countries. And if you defy these terms, you will then lose all the funding. In comparison, on the other side, you are able to give fake reporting that harms the climate even more. But second, they claim that a global market would fix the flaws of regional markets. This is a non-response because it doesn't prove we need a global market. It just proves we need a global solution. We told you why our solutions were global as well. But number one, we also prove that it's possible to opt out of a global market because the punitive mechanism, such as the sanctions that they said, means that they can opt out of the market and therefore leakages that second prop says is largely symmetric. With this, it's clear that they failed to do their research and they are a great part of losing this round. The second issue then was about global climate injustice from the market and profit incentive. We explained that they set a market cap on how many green credits can exist at one time, which means a maximum amount of profit. But second, that they shrink the carbon credit pool every year, which means on two grounds, they are likely to lose this debate. If it's true that it's very good for you to earn these credits and, and companies are invested in the long term, then it's less likely you opt into the market because very short term and eventually your investment will lose value. If you believe the all opposite, which was that there will be short termists in their profit incentive. This mechanizes our first argument about bad projects. But finally, this is not a generic capitalism is bad argument. The nuanced explanation we said was that in status quo, we are trending towards green energy, but they reversed this trend then. The final thing was then about the forms of mechanisms they wanted to put out. I think it's ludicrous that the team that wanted to protect displaced coastal villages wanted to further sanction countries to economically cripple them. I think this means that countries are placed in a false and a hard dichotomy. They are unable to choose the decision that's best for them. For all these reasons, Team Malaysia uniquely proves the best way to not only solve the climate problems we have right now, but also to make further cripple countries from progressing further. We are extremely proud to oppose. I thank the speaker for that fine speech and thank everyone for their substantive speeches so far. I would now like to invite the Honourable Opposition reply speaker. Here, here. Yeah, um, just to check I'm audible, right? Yes, you're audible. 
Great, thanks. Starting in three, two, one. Panel, the navigation of this debate is very simple. Team Philippines tunnel visioned into their own intuition of less, less emissions means they save the world and therefore they should win. Their whole case would only work if status quo that we had to defend was one of inaction, because if not, a trade-off had to be made and a trade-off had to be justified, but Team Philippines never once wanted to do that because our comparative was never on mass and a free-for-all of emissions. Our comparative was a status quo of the Paris Climate Accord in the 21st century with the greatest global opt-in. Third proposition, only wanting to assert that we would have that too, it existed in status quo. It's not engaging and non-comparative because we told you the incentives for the creation and the upholding to stay within these institutions and to remain and for these incentives to uphold to the end of time are immediately eroded when profit is introduced into the equation. That was the very crucial, clear nuance from first, second, and third op, they can't actually co-opt anything. Three issues. Number one, the global carbon market and whether it fails. Secondly, profit incentives and how it corrupts the carbon market. And lastly, on viable alternatives. On the first class as to how the carbon market fails. Note that this shows how Team Philippines fails their burden for climate solvency, and therefore they must lose the round given their own burden is not actually able to be solved. They told you three things, all of which were responded to contrary to what they constantly assert that like we didn't. They talked to you about emission reduction through transitioning. They talked to you about innovation and they talked to you about carbon leakages. We told you that the reason why emission reduction is not the saving grace of side proposition was that emission reduction does not actually mitigate any of the harms to a great and effect effective extent. That even though you're able to trade permits, for example, and limit the amount of emission that exists, you're still going to be ex uh, emitting a net amount of emissions altogether, which means that in the time it takes, for example, for any of this carbons to be offset, for any of the carbon to be reabsorbed in the environment, climate damage was going to be happening. We also told you secondly that there wasn't a one-to-one -one ratio and therefore the calculations that are made when you need to sell trade and create um, projects in order to offset these kinds of carbon emissions means that you're going to be relying on uncalculable, uncalculable and uncomputable data, which means that depending on the day that it's emitted, depending on the weather, this all impacts whether or not the carbon that you're actually emitting is actually effectively able to be offset. Cross multiply this to millions of firms across the state. Every ton that you miscalculate means climate degradation and they're unable to solve their burden. That was very clear why emission reduction was not sufficient for them to actually win this round or fulfill their burden. In. Second on innovation, we told you very clearly, even from first opposition, why they don't get innovation, because innovation was going to be stifled when profit was entered into the equation. Either number one, because even if they did innovate, and this was their best case that we were charitable in, that this was going to be highly expensive technology because they don't have the incentives or the political will to make it accessible to individuals. So yes, smaller firms might have more money, but they also have to pay far more, which neutralizes any of their benefits. But second and more importantly, which is that innovation would not have existed to an extent because they would try to maximize the amount of carbon per Permits and the amount of carbon um, permits they can sell at a time, which means there is no incentive for me to innovate to the point of immediate green carbon capture, because what is the point if I, if I gain too many carbon permits, the next year they're going to be null and void and going to be culled. So it did not matter that they cost more money if I wasn't able to sell all the permits that I earned. Last on carbon leakage, we told you why opt-in was crucial or else they suffer the same kinds of harms, no response even after we proved to you a mechanistic contention. Clear why they feel their burden and it's clear why on op, it's, you start with opt. Second on profit incentives, we told you why profit necessitates the constant we are um, upholding of the carbon market. They say that the permits just become more expensive, but they have a max credit, which decreases annually, which means that the carbon credit is still going to be emitted anyway. We told you why they're deterred from patent and tech sharing because you enable other countries not to buy and gain money from the system. We told you about a decentralized market because you can't have global jurisdiction, no response. Our burden was just to prove that you killed off any other opportunity and you could post us into a failing strategy, clear win for all. I thank the speaker for that fine speech and thank you, opposition. I'd now like to invite the honorable proposition reply speaker here, here. Am I visible and audible? Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
starting my speech in three, two, one. The first thing I want to do is clarify the burden of this debate. Opposition was rather strange. Their battle cry down the bench was to say, we don't need to defend a comparative. Obviously, you need to, because there needs to be a comparison as to explaining why their alternatives was more effective than ours. Absent that, it is unclear why the abstract notions of tech sharing, development aid, actually helps people. How does it reduce em emissions? How does it actually prevent the climate catastrophe? They give you no analysis whatsoever. They just point to it and say, that's good. And we should defend that without explaining why it's comparatively better. So without that analysis, obviously, the structural analysis that we give you as to why our side is more effective in our model just outweighs theirs because they give no analysis whatsoever. The second thing that we wanted to question was the extent of which of the mutual exclusivity that exists for their model. We explained the first thing is that tech sharing can be achieved in other ways, especially when we spur private innovation to ensure we get green tech. Their, their response to this was strange. They say, the, you will not share tech because there's a profit incentive. This is rather strange because the way to earn profit is to sell your tech to be able to ensure that more firms are able to buy off your green tech if you are the firm that innovated it, which therefore means it's unclear as to why you would hoard patents, you'd hoard this innovation because you would sell it off because that's how you earn a profit. The second thing to point out is this notion of development aid is also strange. We pointed out that's money from governments, but the money you get when you buy and sell permits come from companies. So unclear as to why that's likely to be asymmetric. But the second thing we point out is you're able to ensure you give development aid, development aid in terms of the revenue you get from selling permits by the carbon market by selling off your permits to begin with. So at that point, it's unclear as to why any of their model was, any of their comparative was effective, but rather also mutually exclusive, given that we achieve it in other ways. But the last thing to point out is at best, all the responses that the carbon market will fail, and I want you to notice, they're all mitigatory. Because even if it fails, even if it even if offsets don't fully solve the problem, at the very least, in that interim, we were able to have that carbon market where the market did work, where offsets and more companies did plant trees. It was a good thing that we were able to ensure that we reduced emissions in that period of time, and therefore we're still able to access our benefits in that specific time slice. Well, they don't have any benefits. So even if it failed, it's unclear as to why that lost us this round. Will it fail? Their first attempt was to say corruption will happen. Firstly, we explain under their side, giving development aid in massive amounts is a global undertaking. So the same example they had of corrupt locals in India will probably do the same thing of pocketing the money under their side. But the secondly, we explained that the global nature of it also meant that rich firms in the developed world are more likely to want to scrutinize smaller firms in the developing world because they know the corruption is likely to happen. And therefore, there's greater scrutiny if a lot of other firms have their stake in it. Their only response was to say, no, under our side, you have conditional development aid, and therefore we're able to scrutinize it. Why isn't that symmetric and being able to ensure that the kinds of the, the way by which you determine these things is not asymmetric under their side? It's rather disingenuous for them to say corruption is symmetric. Second thing we said was the second thing they said was offsets exist. Firstly, that was never part of our model. They just drew that up out of thin air. They don't explain why offsets were the model, especially when we explain the only way to emit, emit to have emissions is to have a permit. But secondly, that's way better than the comparative where no company plants anything, no company plants trees, and obviously we win that way off. The last thing that they say is developing countries will opt out. The first thing that we question is, are these the people that are so reliant on emissions? Especially as we pointed out, a lot of these firms are small, they don't emit as much, and they only sell it at the point at which they know they can use the revenue tra to transition, and they do not have the ability to, to transition, they will not sell their permits, and therefore the extent of that pullout is likely to be minimal and marginal at best. As I explained again, failure is a mitigatory argument without explaining why the benefits we accrue in that time slice are beneficial. We explained the inherent benefits of a carbon market, which received no response. One, you get mass emission reduction. They just say emission reduction is mitigatory. It's better to have some companies massively reduce emissions, whereas under their side, they don't explain how you get thousands of power plants to reduce emissions, to be able to get CO2 scrubbers, to be able to reduce the amount of carbon you put into the environment. Even if things are incalculable, they're incalculable on either side. The certain metrics being able to reduce emissions, which increase global temperature. Second thing on innovation, we explained that since the permits are likely to be more expensive and you want to sell those permits to earn a profit, even if it goes off, if, even if it is taken away in the long term, in the short term, you can get that profit and therefore we spur better forms of innovation. Lastly, on carbon leakage, we received no response. The fact that the EU market still exists under their, under their side, the, car, the California and China market still exist, but we ensure a global market prevents you from outsourcing your kinds of emissions to ensure that developing countries are much better off. On all these fronts, the argument and case at best is mitigatory. We clearly win this debate. I thank the speaker for that fine speech and thank everyone.